seems so quickly. I think the week flew by. I don't know why. I was busy, so I guess that's why. It went by so fast. So here we are on Friday again, and we are going to read one more chapter. <coughs> Excuse me. Of Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. We are up to chapter seven. We are just moving right along. But here is my shout out. I made a little wrist wallet. I can put, usually I just put my keys in here. And I can zip it closed. Because everywhere you go now, you have to either, you can either have no bag or it has to be a clear bag. Good morning. Good to see you, Wild Info. <laughs> You're so kind. <laughs> this I made. I used a former sweatshirt. I took a sweatshirt and I cut off the cuff of the arm, the cuff of the sleeve. <clears throat> Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you can wear it all these different ways. I just love this top. It's my new favorite shirt. <laughs> I love it. I don't wear it anywhere but on YouTube. I don't, when I go out in public, I dress very modest. I look like a Mennonite when I'm out in public. I wear a shirt all buttoned up. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you. Um, but I, I like to wear, dress a little bit more fun for you too, but out in public I've dressed very, very conservative. I don't want any trouble. And uh, we're just getting started here. Le yeah, definitely. But I made a wrist wallet because when I go out, it's either you can't have a bag or you have to have a clear bag. And, uh, you know, I figure I don't mind leaving the phone in the car or leaving the phone at home. I don't mind leaving a lot of stuff at home. I'm prefer to carry to go light without any baggage but you do need your keys you got to get back in the house right so I put the keys into here female clothes do not have pockets even the jeans yeah thank you even our jeans do not have pockets or if they do they're just for looks and you can't really put anything in the pocket and expect it to be there when you need it so I made this and I can put my keys in here I think It'll hold a little bit of money if I need it, or credit credit card. Not you can put a credit card in here, but it uh, because it wraps around the wrist, the credit card might get a little damaged. But I made a wrist wallet. I thought I would make more, but most people weren't interested. I thought I could make some for my friends, but they didn't seem to care. <laughs> Uh, they like to carry their baggage around with them. I, on the other hand, like to go light. Here's my shout out. It was mine. I call this, look at that. I call this a dust mop. I have to do house chores later. So I have to dust the floor. And I use this. Because, you, you know, I, the trick is you don't want to put this in the washing machine because it'll fill it with lint. But what I do is I'll take it out and use the hose on it, hose it off maybe once a year or twice a year, and then hang it outside to dry. And I sweep it off, or I'll vacuum it out to get the dust out of it. Oof, now i got dust in my, yeah, I love them. And it, it's reusable. It's not like the Swifter that's disposable because I'm trying to be more environmentally friendly. So that is, I, I always dust the floor in the studio every day. But the rest of the house can wait. <laughs> but it does, I do clean the house once a week. So today's the day. Today's the day. Yes. So let's just get started on The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. We'll read one more chapter. It goes very quickly. It's such a quick read. I guess it's technically a, a young adult book. But I got it in the library. I love this story. So we will read this chapter is chapter 7. Oh, what you say? Yes, in Winnipeg, Montana. Oh, wow, I'm in Winnipeg. That's I have ancestry from Quebec. My <clears throat> ancestry on my uh, paternal grandmother's side is from Quebec, and they were in Quebec from the early 1600s, and before that they were in France. But 
early 1600s, I can imagine. It must have been much different then. Uh, oh, je parle un peu français. I speak English and Icelandic and enough French to be a lost tourist. No, I'm not in Vegas. I'm on the east coast of the United States, New York. So, um, not too far from Canada, I guess, but I think to get all the way to Canada from Manhattan would take probably 10 hours to drive. I've never done that. Uh, uh, you're from Iceland? Yeah. Fraubert. Yeah, but uh, yeah, Buri Njavik. Fiera E. Av. 2006, Yara Kenitao, Yara Nema Island Skura, Yosa Husa Rakavak. You, New Sass, Hirta. So I wish Iceland, Milanga Fira Islandi, to win uh, Eurovision. Little skeet. So let's get reading on this. I do have Icelandic ancestry also from my paternal grandfather's side. Uh, from from uh, Iceland and from the Orkneys, which I read Orkney Inga Saga in, in Old Norse. That's my nerd thing is I read in Old Norse, the Old Norse sagas. And uh, at the time I read uh, Orkney Inga Saga, I didn't realize that I was reading about my ancestors. Oh, little Ellis, can you, Amma, Amma mean, no, that. Mm. Okay, well, let's get rolling on this. This is chapter seven, A Day with the Beavers. Wow, your cousin wrote three Icelandic sagas, nice. And I spent time, I'd never been to Orkneys, but I spent time in Fair Island. I spent a summer on Fair Island as a volunteer and I just loved it. I love that lifestyle. And I, I lived in Iceland for a while. I, I lived uh, in Narvik, Narvik. This chapter is called A Day with the Beavers. And here is the picture. And now we will get started. While the two boys were whispering behind, both the girls suddenly cried out, oh, and stopped. The robin, cried Lucy, the robin, it's flown away. And so, and so it had right out of sight. And now what are we to do, said Edmund, giving Peter a look, which was as much as to say, what did I tell you? Shh, look, said Susan, what, said Peter, there's something moving among the trees over there to the left. They all stared as hard as they could, and no one felt very comfortable. There it goes again, said Susan presently. I saw it that time too, said Peter. It's still there. It's just gone behind that big tree. What is it? asked Lucy, trying very hard not to sound nervous. Whatever it is, said Peter, it's dodging us. It's something that doesn't want to be seen. Let's go home, said Susan, and then... Though nobody said it out loud, everyone suddenly realized the same fact that Edmund had whispered to Peter at the end of the last chapter. They were lost. What's it like, said Lucy. It's, it's kind of an animal, said Susan. And then, look, look, quick, there it is. They all saw it this time. A whiskered, furry face, which had looked out at them from behind a tree, but this time it didn't immediately draw back. Instead, the animal put its paw against its mouth just as humans put their fingers on their lips when they were signaling for you to be quiet. Then it disappeared again. The children all stood holding their breaths. A moment later, the stranger came out from behind the tree, glanced all around as if it were afraid someone was watching, said, oh, hush made signs to them to join it in the thicker bit of wood where it was standing and then once more disappeared. I know what it is, said Peter. It's a beaver. I saw the tail. It wants us to go with it, said Susan, and it's warning us not to make any noise. 
I know, said Peter. The question is, are we to go to it or not? What do you think, Lou? I think it's a nice beaver, said Lucy. Yes, but how do we know, said Edmund. Shan't we have to risk it, said Susan. I mean, it's no good just standing here, and I feel I, I want some dinner. At this moment, the beaver again popped its head out from behind the tree and beckoned earnestly to them. Come on, said Peter, let's give it a try. All keep close together. We ought to be a match for one beaver if it turns out to be an enemy. So the children all got close together and walked up to the tree and in behind it. And there, sure enough, they found the beaver. But it still drew back, saying to them in a hoarse, throaty whisper, further in, come further in, right in here. We're not safe in the open. Only when it had led them into a dark spot where four trees grew so close together that their boughs met and the brown earth and pine needles could be seen underfoot because no snow had been able to fall there did it begin to talk to them. And you, are you, are you the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve, it said. We're some of them, said Peter. Shh, said the beaver. Not so loud, please. We're not safe even here. Why, who are you afraid of, said Peter? There's no one here but ourselves. There are the trees, said the beaver. They're always listening. Most of them are on our side, but there are trees that would betray us to her. You know who I mean. And it nodded its head several times. If it comes to talking about sides, said Edmund, how do we know you're a friend? Not meaning to be rude, said Mr. Beaver, added Peter. To uh, Mr. Rude, Mr. Beaver, added Peter, but you see, we're strangers. Quite right, quite right, said the beaver. Here is my token. With these words, it held up a little white object. They all looked at it in surprise till suddenly Lucy said, oh, of course, it's my handkerchief. Don't I gave to poor Mr. Tumnus? That's right, said the beaver, poor fellow. He got wind of the arrest before it actually happened and handed this over to me. He said that if anything happened to them, I must meet you here, meet you here and take you on to, uh, here's the beaver's voice sank into silence and it gave one or two, three, two very mysterious nods then signaling to the children to stand as close around it as they possibly could so that their faces were actually tickled by its whiskers. It added in a low whisper, they say, Aslan is on the move, perhaps has already landed. And now a very curious thing happened. None of the children knew who Aslan was. Good morning, good morning, Maggie TV. Very good to see you. Happy that you're here. And now a very curious thing happened. None of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do. Thank you. But the moment the beaver had spoken these words, everyone felt quite different. Perhaps it has sometimes happened to you in a dream that someone says something which you don't understand, but in the dream it feels as if it had some enormous meaning, either a terrifying one which turns the whole dream into a nightmare or else a lovely meaning, too lovely to put into words, which makes the dream so beautiful that you remember it all your life and are always wishing you could get into that dream again. It was like that now at the, same, at the name of Aslan. Each one of the children felt something jump in, in his inside. Edmund felt a sensation of mysterious horror. Peter felt, Peter felt suddenly brave and adventurous. Susan felt as if some delicious smell or some delightful strain of music had just floated by her. And Lucy got the feeling you have when you wake up in the morning and realize that it is the beginning of the holidays or the beginning of summer. And what about Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy, where is he? Shh, said the beaver, not here. I must, you bring, I must bring you where we can have a real talk and also dinner. No one except Edmund felt any difficulty about trusting the beaver now, and everyone, including Edmund, was very glad to hear the word dinner. They therefore all hurried along behind their new friend, who led them at a surprisingly quick pace, and always in the thickest parts of the forest for over an hour. 
everyone's feeling very tired and very hungry when suddenly the trees began to get thinner in front of them and the ground to fall sleeply, steeply down a hill. A minute later, they came out under the open sky. The sun was still shining and found themselves looking down on a fine sight. They were standing on the edge of a steep, narrow valley at the bottom of which ran, at least it would have been running if it hadn't been frozen, a fairly large river just below them. A dam had been built across the river, and when they saw it, everyone suddenly remembered that, of course, beavers are always making dams and felt quite sure that Mr. Beaver had made this one. They also noticed that he now had a sort of modest expression on his face, the sort of look people have if you're visiting a garden they've made or reading a story they've written. So it was only common politeness when Susan said, what a lovely dam. And Mr. Beaver didn't say hush this time, but merely a trifle, merely a trifle, and it isn't really finished. Above the dam, there was what ought to have been a deep pool but now, of course, on a level floor of dark green ice. And now below the dam, much lower down, was more ice, but instead of being smooth, this was all frozen into the foamy and wavy shapes in which the water had been rushing along at the very moment when the frost came. And where the water had been trickling over and spurting through the dam, there was now a glittering wall of icicles, as if the side of the dam had been covered all over with flowers and wreaths and festoons of the purest sugar. And out in the middle of the part, and partly on top of the dam, was a funny little house shaped rather like an enormous beehive. And from a hole in the roof, smoke was going up, so that when you saw it, especially if you were hungry, you at once thought of cooking and became hungrier than you were before. That was what the others chiefly noticed, but Ed Edmund noticed something else. A little lower down the river, there was another small river, which came down another small valley to join it. And looking up the valley, Edmund could see two small hills, and he was almost sure they were the two hills which the white witch had pointed out to him when he parted from her at the lamp post the other day. And then between them, he thought it must be her palace, only a mile off or less. And he thought about Turkish delight and about being a king, and I wonder how Peter will like that, he asked himself, and horrible ideas came into his head. Here we are, said the beaver, and it looks as if Miss, Mrs. Beaver is expecting us. I'll lead the way, but be careful and don't slip. The top of the dam was wide enough to walk on, though not, for humans, a very nice place to walk, because it was covered with ice, and though the frozen pool was level with it, on one side, there was a nasty drop to the lower river on the other. Along this route, Mr. Beaver led them in single file right out to the middle where they could look a long way up the river and a long way down it. And when they had reached the middle, they were at the door of the house. Here we are, Mr. Beaver, said Mrs. Beaver. I found them. Here are the sons, of, sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. And they all went in. The first thing Lucy noticed as she went in was a burning sound and the first thing she saw was a kind of looking kind looking old sheep beaver sitting in the corner with a thread in her mouth working busily and sewing at her sewing machine and it was from it that the sound came she stopped her work and got up as soon as the sh children came in so you've come at last she said holding out both her wrinkled pulled paws at last to think that ever I should live to see this day. The potatoes are on boiling and the kettle's singing and I dare say, Mr. Beaver, you'll get us some fish. That I will, said Mr. Beaver, and he went out of the house. Peter went with him and across the ice of the deep pool to where he had a little hole in the ice which he kept open every day with his hatchet. They took a pail with them. Mr. Beaver sat down quietly at the edge of the hole he didn't seem to mind it being so chilly, looked hard into it, then suddenly shot in his paw. And before you could say, Jack Robinson had whisked out a beautiful trout and then did it over and over again until they had a fine catch of fish. Meanwhile, the girls were helping Mrs. Beaver to fill the kettle and lay the table and cut the bread and put the plates in the oven and to heat 
to heed and draw a huge jug of beer for Mr. Beaver from a barrel which stood in one corner of the house and to put on the frying pan and, getting, and get the dripping hot. Lucy thought the beavers had a very snug little home, though it was not at all like Mr. Tumnus's cave. There were no books or pictures. Instead of beds, there were bunks, like on a board, board ship built into the wall, and there were hams on, and strings of onions hanging from the roof, and against the walls were gum boots and oil skins and hatchets and pairs of shears and spades and trowels and things for carrying water in and fishing rods and fishing nets and sacks and the cloth of the table, though very clean, was very rough. Just the frying pan was nicely hissing. Peter and Mr. Beaver came in with the fish, which Mr. Peter Beaver had already opened with his knife and cleaned it, cleaned them out in open air. You can think how good the new caught fish smelled while they were frying and how hungry the children longed for them to be done and how very hungry or still they had been before had become before Mrs. Beaver said, now we're nearly ready. Susan drained the potatoes and then put them all back in the empty pot to dry on the side of the range. While Lucy was helping Mrs. Beaver to dish up the trout so that in a very few minutes, everyone was drawing up stools. It was all three-legged stools in the Beaver's house, except for Mrs. Beaver's own special rocking chair beside the fire. And preparing to enjoy themselves, there was a jug of creamy milk for the children. Mr. Beaver stuck to beer and a great big lump of deep yellow butter in the middle of the table from which everyone took as much as they wanted to go with the potatoes. And all the children thought, and I agree with them, that there's nothing to beat good freshwater fish if you eat it when it's been alive half an hour ago and all come out of the pan half a minute ago. And when they had finished the fish, Mrs. Beaver brought unexpectedly out from the oven a great and glorious sticky marmalade roll steaming hot and at the same time moved a kettle onto the fire so that when they'd finished the marmalade roll the tea was made and ready to be poured out and when each person had got his or her cup of tea and each person shoved back his or her stool so as to be able to lean against the wall and gave a long sigh of contentment and now said Mr. Beaver pushing away his empty beer mug and pulling his cup of tea toward him. If you'll just wait till I've got my pipe lit up, lit up and going nicely, why now we've get, get to business. It's snowing again, he added, cocking his eye at the window. Now all the better, because it means we shan't have any visitors, and anyone should have been trying to follow you. Why, he'd find, he won't find any tracks. Okay, well that's the end of chapter seven. That leaves us at chapter eight. We'll read, pick up tomorrow. I should have time tomorrow to do that. And that was that. What a wonderful story. It's so exciting. Now they're in a beaver's lodge that he made himself. Isn't that wonderful? And this is my shout out. It's my very own wrist wallet I made out of an old cuff of a sweatshirt. And I put a little zipper on it. The zip it up and I can put my keys in it. So when you go to concerts and stuff nowadays, it has to either be no bag at all or a clear bag. You know, I can do without a lot of things, but I do need to have my keys somewhere and female clothes don't always have pockets. So I have this, even though I do wear male boy jeans, but, and they do have good pockets, but I don't want to trust the pocket, especially if I'm dancing around like a crazy person. So I put everything in my wrist wallet I could probably be dazzle it and make it all sparkly and jewelry looking, and that might be fun. Maybe I'll do that. It might make it too heavy, but the sky's the limit when you're creative. And this is my product placement. It's going to make me sneeze because it's so dusty. It's my mop, the dust mop. I use to dust the floor. I have to do the house chores today. It's Friday, and I usually do the house chores on Friday. That's life, right? I wouldn't want a maid because I don't want someone touching my stuff, so I do it myself. And it's, that's that. So I hope you have a wonderful Friday. Go outside and play, and let me know you were here so I can go back and watch your channel. I always love to watch your videos. So give me a big kiss. Have a wonderful afternoon. Take care.